everybody. Um, I see some familiar faces from years past. So show of hands, how many of you, this is your first time at Sash as an instructor? Awesome. Keep the hands up. How many is your first time as a volunteer? Okay. Not bad. Well, welcome. Um, I hope you enjoy working for my husband. <laughs> Not like you tell me if you didn't. But the perk of having the two of us talk is that sometimes we get to tell stories. So I might share some stories uh, about Chris. Um, and there will be time for questions after. Um, so today we are going to talk a little bit about this idea of complementarity of the masculine and the feminine, men and women, how they complement each other. Not complement as in, oh my gosh, I love those shoes, but complement, E, not I, as in complete, make complete. Okay, so that's a good distinction to make there. A couple definitions to get us started. The first being, what is complementarity? Complementarity, the seconds, Theology of the Body, um, and his writings, uh, particularly his writings on marriage, family, and womanhood. He would use that word to describe how, as human beings, we all need each other. And because we all need each other, God made us to complete each other. And there are a lot of different levels and aspects to that. We're going to talk about a few of them today. So this idea of complementarity, first and foremost, we need to understand it doesn't mean that men are better than women or women are better than men, okay? It means that we are all equal in dignity. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. This isn't a competition. I am sorry. Well, we <laughs> yeah, it's true. Not saying for the next thing to keep in mind is that as an individual, all by yourself, you are complete. God didn't make you lacking in something. So when we talk about this idea that we can complement each other as men and women, it doesn't mean that by yourself you are not all good, that there's something missing in you, okay? It simply means that we are made for communion with other people, and in finding that communion with others, we can achieve a greater whole, and that greater whole is where that complementarity exists. Does that make sense so far? All right, so that's the first stuff to, to keep in mind. I'd like to start us off with taking a trip back to the Garden of Eden, because that's where this whole idea of complementarity actually starts. And that's where Pope John Paul II began his theology of the body too. So if you'll allow me, I've had this Bible since I was in high school, guys. It's really, really old. It's like an antique. You can laugh at that. <laughs> yeah, we've been married for 20 years. Yeah. Um, all right, so back in the Garden of Eden, and I'm sure you've heard the creation stories a ton of times before, but we're going to skip to the part where, you know, God's going through the order of creation, right? He starts with kind of the lesser things in the creative order, working his way up to his masterpieces. Who are his masterpieces? man and woman, right? And so the Bible tells us, God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air and the cattle and over all the wild animals and all the creatures that crawl on the ground. God created man in his image. In the divine image, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, saying, Be fertile and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all the living things that move on the earth. God also said, See, I give you every seed bearing plant over the earth, every tree that has seed bearing fruit on it to be your food. And to the animals of the land, all the birds of the air, and all the living creatures that crawl on the ground, I give all the green plants for food. And so it happened. Right? We know that God said it was good. Right there in that part of the story, God is establishing that creative order. Who has authority over who in creation, right? And then the next creation story takes it a little bit further for us. 
because we're told in the second story of creation that God formed man out of the clay of the ground, right? So man was formed. He blew into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Then we're told that God planted a garden for the man in Eden. And he made this garden good. He put all the beautiful trees, all the flowers, all the plants, all the living things in that creative order that we heard in that first creation story. And then we're told that after God settled the man in Eden, God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. So I will make a suitable partner for him. And the Lord God formed out of the ground all the animals, all the beings, presented them to the man to see what the man would call them. So what is that part telling us? Can you imagine, right? So here's this man. Here's Adam. He's sitting in this beautiful garden. There are plants and trees and rivers, and it's beautiful. And one by one, God is presenting him all these animals. You know, okay, here you go, Adam. I made this one for you. What are you going to call it? Oh, that's going to be a bunny rabbit. Right? Here's this one for you, Adam. What are you going to call it? Whoa, that's an elephant, right? It's kind of fun to imagine. But imagine that, right? This God who already loves Adam just as much as he loves all of you is showing him, this is what I'm making for you. This is what I'm making for you. So you're not alone. And yet each one of those animals still left Adam feeling lonely. So after giving names to all of the creatures, we're told that God says, None proved to be a suitable partner for the man. So the Lord God cast a deep sleep on the man. And while he was asleep, he took out one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And then the Lord God built up into a woman the rib that he had taken from the man. And when he brought her to the man, the man said, This one, at last, is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman. For out of her man, this one has been taken. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and comes to his wife, and the two become one. Right here in this story, we have our understanding of that complementarity. You see, John Paul II explained to us that complementarity is understood best in terms of gift. You notice how when God presented the woman to Adam, he accepted her as a gift. And in that next moment, we, Adam, by accepting Eve, presents himself to her as her man. He presented himself as a gift. And Eve accepts it. You see how that becomes a circle. Gift and accept the gift. Give the gift and accept the gift. This is part of the complementarity of men and women in a marital relationship. Giving and receiving. And we see it very first back here in Eden. One of the other things we see in the Garden of Eden is the story of the fall. And we see in that story of the fall how we can become distorted. How the idea that as men and women, we can complete each other, particularly when we talk about marriage. But because a gift was rejected in Eden, we all have a tendency to, instead of complementing each other, we can have a tendency to either become very self-protective or even hurt each other. You see, what John Paul II explained to us is there's something very fundamental about who we are as men and women that took place back in Eden that still takes place today. This idea of our masculinity and our femininity and what that means on a really deep internal inside level for us. Back in Eden, when God was presenting creation to the man, back when God established the order of creation, who did he put in charge of? Adam. It's really hot in here. Um, he put Adam in charge of it, right? He put Adam in charge of it, and what did God tell Adam to do? He told him to protect it, to defend it, and to lead. And then God said, but you can't do this alone. And so he created a woman, and he presented the woman to Adam. And when he did that, and Adam accepted her, in a very real sense, Eve was presented to Adam as someone else to be protected and defended. And... 
as a mother. Because later on in the creation story, we're told that Adam named Eve, which means mother of all the men. So back here in Eden, Adam is created as father, a protector, a defender, and a leader. And Eve is created as mother. Now let me ask you something. In order for a woman to, in a very real sense, protect the life that's growing inside her, to defend that life growing inside her, so in a sense, mothers are also protectors and defenders. Don't get defensive, women. Don't you think that that vulnerability that comes with pregnancy, that vulnerability that comes with caring for and nurturing a small child, particularly as an infant who needs his mother, in that order of creation, doesn't somebody else need to be looking out for her so she can in turn look out for the <coughs> Doesn't that make sense? Doesn't God's creative order make sense? And in doing that, again, we see a complementarity cycle. Man, by protecting and defending and leading his family, allows the woman to protect and to defend and to nurture and to raise the children. Why? As a gift. Because in doing that, what happens? Society grows. As a family grows, those children who are nurtured, protected, and defended grow up. And that cycle continues. Starts out really small, and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until we have continents. So we have a whole world, all built on families. So there is this idea, this very real idea, that in the order of creation, men are created in a very specific way to lead. Okay. Women are created not only to seek security, but in seeking security, they give purpose to men. See how that works? Here we have another example. But because of that fall, right? Let's talk about that. What happened there? Adam and Eve, they're in the garden. They're enjoying themselves. It's beautiful. Here's that one tree, right? The tree that God was like, okay, everything else, guys, you can have, but that one, don't touch it. Because if you do, you'll die. So, what does the serpent do? Satan comes up. Who does he go to? Not Adam. He goes up to Eve. Hey, if you eat that fruit, you won't, you won't die. You'll just be like God, and God doesn't want that. Right? Isn't that what he tells her? In that moment, Eve, in her femininity, is created, right, to, to in a sense, seek security. And when she's told that by eating, that God isn't someone who can be trusted. You can't trust God to provide that security for you. Right? You need to be like God. What's he keeping from you? You better eat that fruit. But where's that? Instead of leading and protecting the garden from Satan, his wife from the temptation, Adam stays quiet. It's understood by most theologians that they were together, that Adam and Eve are together in this moment. And instead of stepping in and defending what was given to him to defend, I'll let you take it. And so what does Eve do? She eats the apple. Probably actually like the fruit. But she eats the fruit. And then what does she do? She gives it to her husband. Just like we talked about all those good circles, right? What's this one? It's like the reverse. Adam failed to protect. So what does Eve do? She goes, no, take this. Take this, right? Women, we all know we have this sort of like superpower ability that if we really wanted to use it, you can get men to do what you want. <laughs> right? And sometimes that's really good. Let's fast forward a moment and talk about an, an instance where that was really good. The wedding at Canaan. Okay? Mary, mother of God, the epitome of womanhood. She's at this party, right? If you're playing talk bingo over there, like, oh, she hit that. Oh, I've heard that before. <laughs> Sorry. 
But okay, we're at Cana. They're having a great party. It's lasting all week long because that's what they, they that's what they did. Thank goodness the writing sign up help me. Don't last for a week. Um, what happens? They run out of wine. How embarrassing for this couple who's getting married. Now, Mary, in her femininity, in her mother, in her perfection, notices. I happen to think that in Jesus' humanity, he was too busy having fun with the guys to notice that the wine ran out. So his mom comes up to him and she's like, hey, hey, they ran out of wine. This is embarrassing. We need to do something, right? She's, I know who you are. I know you can do this. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. no mom, right? <laughs> <laughs> My time hasn't come yet. So what did Mary do? She does that really feminine thing where I can just imagine her like mentally patting Jesus on the head because she's still his mom. And then she goes over to the guys in charge of the wine, points Jesus out and says, just do whatever he tells you. You go talk to him. <laughs> well, now he can't say no, can he? Right? Isn't that a great example of how, as women, we can kind of do that? And that's not bad. That's good. But in, in Eden, the opposite happened. Instead of Eve, the mother of all the living, encouraging, manipulating, for lack of a better word, her husband to do something good, to do something right, to become who he was to be, instead she encourages him to sin. The two sins together in their masculinity and femininity. And as a result, we sort of repeat the same thing over and over and over again. And we have distortions of what it means to be a leader, and we have distortions of what it means to seek security or to use that feminine genius of encouraging others to be who they want. You with me so far? Now, the good news is that we're not doomed to repeat that cycle in Eden, but we do need to be aware of it. And so it's really helpful to know some of the ways we are different and some of the ways we are the same. The way our differences complement each other. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna out Chris for a moment. I told you I'd share stories. We had a really great example of this idea of a husband, a leader of his family, protecting his family. You know, sometimes as human beings, the very <laughs> first person we need to protect others from is ourselves, right? I don't know about you all, but I'm a mess. And sometimes I really just need to keep that mess to myself. And I don't need to be spitting that mess out on other people. But sometimes in a family, particularly the husband, the leader of that family, needs to be able to um, protect his wife from herself when she doesn't know she needs to be protected from herself. You see, John Paul II explained to us that on the whole, men, because of the way they are created, have a drive and a tendency to place themselves as leaders in a big picture sense. And we can kind of see that, right? If you think of a lot of CEOs or leaders of corporations and countries and militaries, they tend to be men. Does it mean women can't do it? Of course not. We still have Joan of Arc, right? But it just means, on the whole, this is how we are. It's how we're made. It's how we're wired. But women, John Paul II says, have a gift and a propensity to see the individual human being and want to nurture them and invite them into the bigger whole, right? Doesn't that kind of make sense? And if you think about it, that works. You need somebody to be looking out for everybody else and seeing the big picture. But then you also need somebody saying, I see you, come on, we're doing okay. I see you too, come on, okay, right? On that, not a lower level, but on the interpersonal level. And so we see this, I saw this recently, it played out in our family a couple years ago. There was a woman who was, she was in a lot of crisis. And one of the things that I am, am trained in is trauma and, and crisis. 
But in this particular case, this woman's needs were very great. She wasn't exactly tapping into the resources that she needed to. And she was becoming extremely unhealthily attached to me. I didn't know how to handle it and I didn't know how to stop it. And I couldn't quite see it for myself. But it was getting stressful. And it was getting, I don't want to say harmful, but it was getting psychologically harmful. <laughs> too much anxiety, too much pressure. And that wasn't good for our family. We didn't know how to get out of it. Until one day, Chris noticed. And he was like, you know what? I need to put a stop to this. And so he took my phone because she would text me all the time. Morning, noon, night. Never, wouldn't stop. And he, he called her and said, or texted, I don't remember now. But he essentially said, You've been given all the resources that you need to heal. It's time for you to choose to, to take them. But this is no longer healthy or good for my wife and my family. And so I'm going to cut this off. And you're going to be blocked on my wife's phone. If you need something, you contact me. I was it, you did. And I was so relieved. <laughs> right? I wasn't mad. I wasn't like, how dare you? Right? No. Oh, thank goodness. I could not protect myself. I, I wasn't kidding. So isn't that really neat when we can see the way God made us to be work out in our, in our everyday lives? Right? In a different sense, God made us as men and women, different, equal in dignity, but different physiologically, psychologically, and spiritually. And these differences that we have complement each other. And so I'd like to talk about those a little bit too and see if we can find them back in Eden as well. Physically, I don't think it's earth shattering for anyone to hear that men and women are created physically different. Is it? You're looking at me very blankly. Is this rocket science, guys? Do we need to like go back to biology 101? Okay, okay. You're like, no, please, no. That's weird, Mr. Trickett. No. Um, physically, on the whole, men have more physical strength than women. Does that mean women aren't strong? No, they can birth babies. Does it mean that women are weak? No, but it means that our physical strength is disproportionate to each other. My sons will beat me in arm wrestling. They would beat me in arm wrestling if I could bench press as much as they could. Why? They have more physical upper body strength. Generally, that's how men are built. Even in women and men's sports, this is why we have women and men's sports. Because when women and men compete against each other, it's not an equal match. Men, nine times out of ten, will beat the women when it comes to physical strength every time. Does that mean men are better? It means we're made differently. Because I'll tell you why. It's a good thing in our family. I'm the one who was birthing the baby. <laughs> Does that make me better than Chris? <laughs> oh, good. You're awake. You're awake. <laughs> we're different. Physically, we're different. But physically, we're also made to fit together. In order for a human being to be created, men and women have to fit together. God did that too, as a physical sign of the complementarity men and women have. You see, that's the secret of that theology of the body. The idea that our bodies tell a story about God. That in your masculinity and your femininity, you teach us something about God. And God doesn't have one part of him that's better than another. He's all good. That's why as men and as women, different but good. In a very different sense, right? Another area where men and women are very different, but it's a good thing they're very different physically, is in their fertility. A woman's fertility is cyclical. A man's is not. This is a good thing. Could you imagine if both men and women had all the crazy hormonal needs going on? That wouldn't work. It also plays into that idea, right? When we look back at men as being leaders or as defenders, protectors, you want someone leading, protecting, and defending who is not 
influenced by hormonal fluctuations, right? You want someone who can have a steady, calm presence, who always has testosterone at their disposal to make them brave or reckless, sometimes both, <laughs> right? But women, in order for us to nurture life, we need cyclical hormones. We need hormones that go up and down and sideways and every other way. Why? Because it's that hormonal fluctuation that allows the woman's body to get ready to have a baby and then to nurture one, should God give one, and then to bond with that child for the good of the child. Without cyclical up and down crazy hormones and the ability to handle it, society wouldn't continue. Without a man's ability to stay calm, steady, Society would continue. Do you see how that works together? Is one better than the other? No, but we need both. We need both in a family. We need both in a society. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Another way or another area where men and women are different is psychological. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone either. <laughs> In fact, and this is kind of half biological, but when it comes to the brain, there's another one for your bingo card, Dave. When it comes to the brain, men and women have different amounts of the white matter called the corpus callosum. It's like a information bridge highway in the brain. In women, it's more highly developed. This doesn't mean that men are brain damaged. Not what I'm saying. <laughs> well, some <are> <laughs> The white matter in your brain, it's where information gets yeeted from like one part of it to the other, and it's where memories are stored, and it helps women multitask, right? It's why when we go home tonight, I can be on the phone keeping the dog alive, giving his medicine, making sure all the kids are in the house, and cooking dinner. And Chris can do one of those things at a time. <laughs> <laughs> this is not bad. This is good. It's good for both of us. I'm also a better cook. <laughs> That's a fair point. He's better girl. Um, but because of this, right? This this difference in white matter, mm -hmm. it's also why a woman, that's why I could tell you, 21 and a half, 22 years ago when we got engaged, what I was wearing, what shoes I had on, what shoes I almost wore, what I almost wore, what I ate for dinner, what earrings I had on, and exactly what Chris said when he proposed to me. And why if you ask him, I know for a fact he will be able to tell you, she said yes. It's not because he wasn't emotionally invested in it. He was not. It's because our brains are different. They store information differently. And that's a good thing. Why? Well, partly because it goes back to that idea of men being able to protect, to lead, to defend and women being able to nurture, to gather, to keep little people alive, <laughs> right? At the same time as all the other stuff that has to go on. We have a term for this in our family. It's called mammothing. Why? Well, if you think back to like our primitive brain during our primitive times, right? What did men tend to do? They had to hunt. They had to be able to say, okay, hunt, feed my family. Mammoth, <coughs> the mammoth, right? And be able to laser focus on it. Men have this amazing ability to laser focus on something. God did that. That's good. Women tend to be more gatherers, right? If we think back again to that primitive brain, that primitive time, we need to be able to pick the berries and get the herbs and get the kindling for the fire and keep little human beings alive and do all the same, all of that at once while the man has to mammoth. Right <laughs> now, that might be our primitive brain. How does that play out in like everyday life? There was a time we were newly married, didn't have kids yet, and it was a weekend, and I was bored. And so, in my brain, I thought we could go to the mall, let's go to the mall, and we could go window shopping, and we could go to the food court, and we'll just have a little nice afternoon, and it'll be great. But for whatever reason, I didn't think. Chris would actually go for me saying, like, let's go to the mall, right? I think his eyes would have glazed over, and he would have been like, that's not so much fun at all. So I did that female thing where we 
try to find a way to get what we want by manipulating. And <laughs> I, uh, I said, you know what? We still need a shower curtain. We don't have a shower curtain yet. Why don't we go to the mall and get a shower curtain? Oh, okay, great idea. What I didn't know what happened there was meth. <laughs> because we got to the mall, we parked outside of a department store. We walk into the department store, and I'm already I'm already doing my primitive brain thing. Ooh, throw pillows. Ooh, blankets. Look at those curtains. I think I like those, and then I can't find curtains. Well, about five minutes later, he comes back holding a shower curtain and goes, okay, I got it. We can go. <laughs> Mammoth. <laughs> he hunted the shower curtain. I killed that thing. <laughs> <laughs> he was victorious. We didn't even make it to the food court. Right? But that might be, it's, it's a funny story. Totally true. But that's one of those ways where how we are made even in our brains plays out in our modern culture is either one bad dumb, or just different. And now I know that if I want to go to the mall, I just have to say, I want to go to the mall. And then I'll go with my friends. <laughs> <laughs> another way or another aspect of our differences, right, is, is the spiritual. Spiritually, men and women are different. We relate to God differently. I relate to God as a woman. Not that God is the woman, I'm the woman relating to him, right? Chris, the men here, you relate to God as a man. That's good. But it actually means that we are having a relationship with God that's going to look different. And again, that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. Because remember, as men and women, we're teaching each other something about God, too. God asked us to call him Father. But God, in the deeper sense, has both the masculine and feminine, right? Because he's God in order to create both. He needs to have both of those characteristics. Yet he asks us to relate to him as God. A little girl relates to her dad differently than a little boy. And a father, an earthly father, and our heavenly father, is going to, I don't want to say treat a son differently than a daughter, but they interact with them differently, encourage them differently, and protect them differently. Isn't that an interesting thing to think about? How does God relate to you as a little boy? Or as a little girl, because we are all his. And then he gave us a brother, Jesus. He gave us the Savior, the human form of himself, so we can relate to him interpersonally. And even there, we see the relationships that Jesus had with his male followers and his female followers were different, <laughs> but they were both good. What did he do with his apostles? He trained them up and he taught them how to eventually be priests. What, and, and the first bishops, what is the job of a priest? What is the job of a bishop? To protect and defend his flock, his spiritual children. Primarily to protect our souls, to pass to heaven. Can you think about it? But then Jesus had female followers too, right? Some of them are mentioned in the Bible multiple times. Mary, Martha, Mary, the wife of Clopas, a lot of Marys, right? Mary Magdalene. And we're told that they followed him too. Why? Well, I happen to think that if the women didn't follow along as they were all traveling, those men did not have people. <laughs> Why? Well, if you think about it in a very real sense, they were on a mission, right? Mammoths. Save the people, heal the sick, <coughs> live out the Beatitudes, learn from Jesus. I bet you anything, it was those women who were following, who were there like, we better grab those berries on the way, right? We better fill up the basket with this food. Let's make sure the men eat tonight. We need both. 
Jesus had both men and women following him in his life, playing very different roles. Isn't it interesting that when he rose from the dead, theologians think the first person Jesus went to was his mom. I mean, what good son wouldn't? <laughs> there you go. You got that. No, right? But that's what, that's what the thought is, that there is a time lapse. There's a lag in scripture where Jesus had risen, but nobody knew it yet, I bet his mom. But then in scripture, we're told the first people that see him, they're the women. Why? Well, because here we have a little bit of Eden still playing out. What were the apostles doing? Hiding the guys. Why were they hiding? Because they hadn't fully accepted and realized that now it was their job to defend the church, to protect the church, to control the church. What were the women doing? They were doing their woman thing. I need to go nurture. I need to go care for the body. I need to go take care of him. There we are again in our masculinity. And so Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene, and she's like, oh, it's you. And he's like, okay, don't touch. Go, go tell my brothers. Go tell the apostles. And then they didn't believe it. But, well, one of the stories, they're like, I think you're crazy. Eventually, they get there. And then what happens? John tells us they raced, literally raced to the tomb. You ever notice that in the, in the scripture? John's like, I got there first. <laughs> so y'all remember that. For all of eternity, I got there first. Right? Competing. Spiritually, men and women were different. That's a good thing because we can also encourage each other to understand God in deeper and more profound ways. In our, I need Chris's perspective. He can understand things about God in a deeper way or even more quickly than I can. Sometimes. And hopefully vice versa. Together, we have that circle again, right? We build each other up. We encourage each other. We complement each other. And that's God's whole thing. And I think that's why this topic is particularly important for us to kind of think about nowadays. We hear a lot about gender. We hear a lot about what makes a woman a woman or what makes a man a man. And very often it's reduced to something very superficial. And that's actually quite insulting to all of you. Because what makes you men and what makes you women is so much deeper than the outside. It's interior. It, the saints tell us it's essentially it's part of your soul. That when you get to heaven, before you're giving your glorified body, Edith Stein tells us, within the soul, because it is of God, there exists the masculine in But in women, it's like the soul is polarized you ever do that with magnets? Like if you have these little metal pieces on a tray and you put, put a magnet on it and you put it down, the metal pieces start to like all go towards the magnet. You know what I'm saying? Can you picture it? Good, it's still good. Um, Edith Stein tells us that's essentially how the soul is. Within a woman, the soul is polarized towards the feminine. And in men, the soul is polarized towards the masculine. So when you get to heaven, before you receive your glorified body, when you are soul, it will still be masculine to me. You're not going to relate to God, even in eternity, as an androgynous being without a sexuality. That's how deep your masculinity is. That's why even when a man does something that's typically considered a girl thing, or why a woman does something typically considered a guy thing, they're really not. They're just doing it as a man. Or as a woman, if I was to, I don't know, go join an adult bodybuilding contest and compete against all the men, I would be crushed, first of all. But if I did that, it wouldn't make me a man. It would make me a woman. Bodybuilding and competing against men. Right? If, if Chris all of a sudden to decide, 
I don't know, he decided taking up crocheting flowers <laughs> that wouldn't make him a woman. It would just make him a man doing something with a woman. Maybe not much. Right? Does that make sense? And see, we lose sight of that when we have so much hitting us, telling us that to be a man or to be a woman is superficial, or it's a choice that you can make, or that you can decide on any given day what you are. From all of eternity, from the moment you were created, your soul was polarized. And for the rest of your life, you can fight against that, like some people do, or you embrace it. You become even more fully the man or the woman God created you to be. And in doing that, you become more complete as a person. And if your vocation is marriage, then you become an even more complete whole in that marital relationship by being a gift and by receiving the gift of yourself over and over again. The other vocations have a different reciprocity. We'll talk about that the next time I can talk to you about vocations. Um, but the idea of complementarity is not something that we're being presented with in the human life. Right? We're always, it always seems like men and women are competing. Constantly. Who's better? Who's better? Who's worse? Who do I want to be today? When the reality is we need each other in all of our masculinity and all of our femininity. Why? Because we all want to know something deeper about God. And relating to each other as men and women is going to teach us something. And that's a really I'm going to pause there, take a drink, and see if you guys have any questions. Questions? Anybody? Yeah. You said that men and women are different spiritually. Would you um, say that, like, and I know each person is different, but, like, would you say that there are some virtues or vices that are, like, more drawn to the masculine and feminine side? And um, building on that, like, would you say that men and women without virtue devices like like humility would look different like on a woman than a man. So yeah, that's a really good question. I would say virtues and vices, we are going to encounter them the next time. We're going to encounter them as men or as women. So yes, they're going to look different. What I would say is that because of the fall, our masculinity and femininity have a tendency to be distorted. And God even, he kind of explained this for us after he had to tell Adam and Eve what the consequences of their sin was. Because it boiled down to what God explained to them, right? First of all, let's, let's talk about this. God, he doesn't ever punish because he's mean up there. So when Adam and Eve sinned, it wasn't like God came down with the big fist from heaven to smite them. And then out of anger was like, oh yeah, labor, ladies. And oh yeah, men, work for the rest of your life, right? He wasn't being mean. He wasn't being vindictive. What God had to do is say, because of your sin, there are consequences, guys. This is why I didn't want you to eat the fruit. Because now, as a result of your sin, men, your tendency is going to be to take that God-given good internal drive to be leaders and protectors and distort it and become dictators and domineering. And women, because of that God-given desire to be, in a sense, protected or to have security so you can mother, now your distortion is going to be you are going to grasp for it. And in grasping for it, you are going to nag. And you are constantly going to use your feminine ability to help other people become who God made them to be. And instead, you are going to use it selfishly and manipulate to hurt. And so that's what we see playing out, I say, to answer your question, is we see the distortions. And our tendency, because of the fallen nature, when people say this is the big word, we can fall into that. And so on the whole, that's where men and women, because of who they are as men and women, 
that's where they tend to default. Uh, I think we're next. <laughs> Femininity. Okay. You're welcome. Two <laughs> questions. I have one. When are they going to fix the air conditioning? <laughs> <laughs> Good gracious. It's hot. Anything else? So it, that's a good question because depending on your vocation, it doesn't change your major, right? So whether you are a priest, whether you're religious, whether you're married, or whether you're consecrated single, you're still going to have that relationship with someone. In the case of religious or with sisters, they are brides of Christ. And so what they are doing essentially is creating or forming a relationship with Jesus where they look directly to him for that, for that protection, for to fill in the gaps. Every one of us needs to feel loved, we need to feel seen, we need to feel heard. In a marriage, you look to your spouse for that, and God works through your spouse to meet that need. When you are a bride of Christ, Jesus himself steps in to do that. And as a priest, we look to the church. And to God in a very different sense through the church. Good question. Yes. How are you married when you go to your spouse? Is it different to the marriage? Well, part of it is number one, I would say, accepting the other person as a gift. That in my life, right, Chris is the greatest gift, God will ever or, or has ever given me. And, honey, I am yours, right? When we can accept each other as a gift, the way we relate to them becomes different, right? If I see a person that way, I'm going to treat them differently than if I think someone is like, not a gift. But marriage is hard. Your vocation is hard. And it can very oftentimes also become the cross. God asked us to love each other the way his son loved. And what did his son do? He crawled on the cross and he died. So even in marriage, as we're relating to each other as gifts, we also have to learn how to die to ourselves for the other person. And that's really difficult. And it takes sometimes a lifetime of marriage to hope you got it right. And that's why we have the sacraments to help us. And that's why we try to communicate. And we have, gosh, if you need it, therapists, right? It's not easy. But that's the goal. Does that answer your question? Sounds like money. Yes. Well, I don't think modesty relates just to feminine. <laughs> I think... Modesty is not in and of itself a virtue. It is a fruit of the virtue of chastity and of temperance. Modesty is not a hemline. It's not a measurement. And it's not a list of you can wear this and you can't wear this. John Paul II explains to us that modesty is an internal disposition. And the reason we would choose to be modest is first and foremost, not because of anybody else, but it's first and foremost because I recognize that I have a dignity that deserves to be respected. And I am going to present myself in a way that's appropriate to my circumstances and appropriate for the dignity that I know I have. That's modesty in a nutshell. We tend to get it a little bit wrong and reduce it again to cosmetics. But that doesn't really work. First, it has to be about being appropriate. Because if I stood up here in my bathing suit, that would be weird. It would also be very immodest for these circumstances. But when I go to the beach in August, 
and I wear my bathing suit, that's not. That's appropriate. Now, if my bathing suit called undue attention to myself and I presented myself in a way that made me seem like an object instead of a person with dignity, that would be important. Does that, that kind of answer your question? Any more questions?